in order to get changed. Now my thesis here, I'm going to be reading a lot to you because the devil is in the details. My thesis here is very simple. The post-World War II national security establishment was faced with a threefold strategic problem. The first was the post-war Axis elites. They didn't just die and go away quietly into the night. And there are indications of an ongoing independent research projects threatening the national security of the United States, and we'll get into that in this talk. The second is the communist Soviet bloc, obviously. And then finally, and in my opinion, the most important is the UFO and demonstrations that occurred over sensitive airspace and defense installations. That's a huge part of the problem that we have to look at in terms of a secret space program or breakaway civilization. Now, each of these factors contributed to the formation of a national security finance intelligence, military, industrial complex. And additionally, the national security establishment would have concluded that some UFO activity, and I'll review it tomorrow, constituted a threat, perhaps not an imminent one, but a threat nonetheless. And this is the key point. This will require the institution of a long-term mega Manhattan project. And of course, once we've said that, we need the financing. Now, the perception on the part of the national security apparatus that some UFO activity could be construed as potentially threatening and therefore potentially hostile required them in their thinking, and what we're trying to do here, folks, is reverse engineer the policy formation culture of the national security establishment in the United States. So this would have been viewed, in my opinion, as something that they would have viewed as potentially hostile. And this requires the establishment of this long-term mega Manhattan project in order to investigate and, if possible, develop the technologies to emulate the performance of the UFO. And this you saw in particular in, in Mark's excellent presentation this morning. Now this required in its turn the establishment of an immense and entirely hidden system of finance. And I want to stress this point because if you are wondering why the financial world now makes no sense, I think this talk may give you some clues as to what may be going on behind the scenes. Now, this system of finance has to be entirely hidden. In other words, what I'm talking about now in this talk is not the black budget. I'm talking about something even deeper and even more off the books, all right? Now, this finance system, this hidden system of finance was laid in the years immediately following World War II, and we'll get into the details in this talk. It's based to some degree, though not entirely, on the striking of a modus vivendi with the former Axis elites in order to utilize their funds and their talent and their technologies. So what we have, I'm suggesting to you, and what we will see as I outline in this talk, is the institution of financial fraud on an industrial scale that persists over several decades. I'm going to try and highlight what I think are three, not the only, but at least three of the major contributory factors that if we're going to reverse engineer the policy formation culture of the national security establishment that we have to look at. The first is obviously 1947. There's a huge UFO flap in the year 1947. Uh, I believe Richard Dolan at one point uh, when we talked recently said that there were something like hundreds of them all over the world. The second in thing that we're going to be talking about is a German-American engineer 
by the name of Alfred Leding, and the very first assessments that were done within the national security establishment. Remember, 1947 is also the year that President Truman signs the National Security Act, creating the CIA and the NSA into law. And as we're going to see a little later on, 1947 is a crucial year financially. All right. Lading offered the first assessments, and interestingly enough, we're going to see that the first thing that he suspects is somehow the Nazis are involved with this. But later on, Alfred Lading also offers, for very deliberate, very specific, very clear reasons, another hypothesis, not in opposition to the first one, but rather as a supplement to it. And that is, he thinks that some of it may be coming from off-world simply because we don't have the production capacity to produce all of these UFOs seen all over the world, oftentimes in the same time frame. The national security establishment had come to hold two things at the same time, not in opposition to each other, but as complements of each other. First, there's some secret human source, possibly independent Nazis, possibly some other group, that is behind some UFO reports. And secondly, it had also come to hold that no terrestrial explanation by itself could account for all of them simply because of the enormous cost and production difficulty. Now I keep saying enormous cost because obviously we're leading up to the financial problem here. So what are the implications of this? This means the United States national security military industrial finance complex is confronted by a triple threat, communists, Nazis, UFOs. And that his response has to do four things. First of all, it has to develop technologies that can do triple duty dealing with all three potential threats. Not the least of which is finding out, if possible, where they're coming from and what they're doing. Secondly, since the UFO represented the greatest long-term potential, not imminent, potential threat, a long-term program had to be put into place to emulate its technological performance. And that requires, number three, a decades-long financial commitment. In other words, this is the man, oops, whoa. This is the Manhattan Project on steroids. The Manhattan Project lasted three and a half years. It cost billions of dollars, in 1945 dollars, incidentally. This is a problem that's going to require decades and funds in the trillions of dollars for decades. The fourth thing that it requires, therefore, is not only secrecy regarding the technological research aspects of it, but it will require extreme secrecy in the funding mechanism for it. Then, but think about this, because this is a... Now let's look at this Axis loot for a moment, because everyone thinks about the Nazis going around Europe and plundering art treasures and stockpiling everything. Nobody remembers the Japanese. But in point of fact, throughout World War II, there was a Japanese operation called Operation Golden Lily. It was led by a member of the imperial household by the name of Prince Chichibu. 
So in other words, this is not even in the hands of the Kempite. It's not even in the hands of Japanese intelligence. This is directly an operation of the imperial house. And what they did is they went in. You, you think the Nazis set the level for efficiency of plunder. Mm -mm. The Japanese went into Asia and China and Southeast Asia and literally suctioned every last scrap of any kind of precious metal, gold, silver, platinum, you name it, jewels, cash, artworks, ancient manuscripts, everything that they could lay their hands on to bring it back to Japan. This was called Operation Golden Lily. Now, this gentleman here, toward the end of the war, after the American invasion of the Philippine archipelago, learns about it. And his name is Captain, later General, Ed Lansdale. That name might be familiar to some of you JFK assassination researchers. Lansdale learned about Operation Gold Lily and all of this vast loot that was buried on Luzon and Mindanao and all over the Philippine Islands. And when he learned about it, he flew to Tokyo to debrief General MacArthur. And MacArthur said, well, that's interesting. I need you to get on a plane and fly to Washington and brief President Truman. We're talking again, folks, in 1945 dollars terms of billions of dollars. Billions. So Lansdale flies to Washington and briefs Truman. Now please note right at the bottom here, this is the beginning in 1947, not only of a black budget, but please understand me now, something completely separate and totally hidden. Truman, on learning of it, discusses it with his cabinet and, quote, decided to proceed with the recovery, but to keep it a state secret, unquote. Now, folks, at that moment, President Truman put the American intelligence apparatus in the banking business. At that moment. I leave it to you to work out all of the implications of that decision for what's going on right now, both domestically and internationally. Now that bit of information, incidentally, if you don't know this work, it's, it's a wonderful book discussing Operation Golden Lily called Gold Warriors. It's by Sterling and Peggy Seagrave. Now, there's another aspect to this story. This is what the Seagraves themselves state in Gold Warriors on page three, a little later on. The treasure was combined with Axis loot recovered in Europe to create a worldwide covert political action fund to fight communism. This black gold gave the Truman administration access to virtually limitless unvouchered funds for covert operations. But I believe it goes beyond mere covert operations because as I put it down here at the bottom of the slide, the sheer scale when you combine that Japanese loot and that Nazi loot suggests to me, given the threefold strategic problem that we're facing, that much more than communism or covert operations against it, or even post-war Nazis or whoever else, but that the UFO was a long-term problem requiring that technological emulation. And if you're setting up a system of hidden finance, Go back to what I said previously about Richard Bissell and the Rockefellers 
and the Rockefellers contributing their own personal private family funds to the development of the backup camera system for the early corona satellites. Oh, we'll donate you the money. You don't have to tap the taxpayer. Go back to that element and what you see now forming with this hidden system of finance is a nexus between this black projects world requiring its hidden system of finance and that's going to demand at some point the participation off the books of the major prime banks of the West. It in turn implies something else. Since you're keeping all of that Japanese gold secret, it means that any amount or estimate of the amounts of gold that you see in the world today are probably badly obfuscated and perhaps off as much as an order of magnitude. And that implies yet something else. Because if you're keeping this as a hidden system of finance, what you see you can do is you can take all that gold and all that silver and all those gems and all those bonds and all that liquid cash, move it into those participating prime banks and keep it all off the books. That's your secret reserve. And you can rehypothecate that reserve over, because you see it's secret, over and over and over and over. In other words, what I'm telling you is exactly what Richard Dolan has said in his books. The UFO is not only the principal problem of post-war historiography, it's the principal hidden problem in finance. So let's look and sum it up. Truman's 1947 decision to keep all this access plunder a state secret implies truly profound and significant things for the long-term financial structure of the West. Number one, it implies the intelligence national security complex now entered the realm of international finance and banking directly. Number two, it implies that the intelligence community had to have at a lower level of complicity the participation of prime banks around the world to make such a system work. What I've just told you is that they are participants in a system ultimately involving fraud. Thirdly, it implies the further complex interface of the American intelligence national security oligarchy. After all, we're not going to be able to recover all that Axis loot without them telling us where it is. And they're going to drive, trust me, a hard bargain. So it requires the interface not only with their scientists, but with their managers, with their technical people, and as we saw with Galen, with who? With their intelligence people. To the point that we keep that intelligence network intact. The fourth thing it implies is the creation of a vast secret mechanism of finance, totally unaccountable to the public, and their institutions of government and increasing the dominant financial concern of the American federal government. Fifthly, it implies the creation of a vast secret mechanism of finance capable of the manipulation of markets, for example, the bullion markets. And finally, point six and seven, it rationalizes almost perfectly why there is such widespread numerical discrepancies in the various estimates of the amounts of various types of bullion actually in existence, allowing you to manipulate those markets, 
and 7. It rationalizes a hidden reason for the formation of the Bilderberg Group between the Rockefeller interests representing the new financial intelligence complex and Prince Bernard, former manager of IG Farben Industry, and the consistent presence of Dr. Hermann Josef Ops, CEO of Deutsche Bank, at an early stage of the Bilderberg meetings, which becomes the mechanism for coordinating the movement of European access plunder directly and secretly into Western banks. Well, I, I think another piece of the puzzle, which is... Well, they were funded from here. Well, let's, let's step back, because I think what is not commonly understood by many people is the cooperation that occurred at a very high level between the American corporate establishment and the Nazis throughout the war. Yes. So this is a, this is a little known aspect, and and you're right. Most people are unaware of this it's because it's been carefully, carefully sanitized. Um, this cooperation, Catherine, really began in a series of nexus and relationships between the wars, between some some very powerful figures in the American finance and, and corporate worlds, uh, people like Farish and Standard Oil and. Uh, McKittrick, who later would become part of the Bank of International Settlements, people like this on the American side. And, of course, in that, you have the Dulles brothers, you know, Sullivan and Cromwell in, in, in Wall Street in New York City. All of these people developed a set of, of corporate relationships with their counterparts in Germany. And all of this, of course, was to revitalize the German economy. And eventually, of course, a lot of these corporations were financial backers of, of the Nazis and, and of Adolf Hitler. But on the German side, of course, you had people like Hermann Schmitz that eventually became the, the chairman of uh, IG Farben and Kurt Schrader, who was a banker in, in Cologne and also subsequently a Gestapo general. And, you know, so, right. you, know you pull on this thread long enough and you're going to see, you know, just a real den of vipers. And, and there, it's kind of incestuous the way that, that these corporate and financial relationships are all intertwined. And a key figure in that interwar period was, of course, the fellow that eventually would become Hitler's Reichsbank president, and that was a fellow by the name of Hjalmar Horace Greeley Schacht. And he's a key figure in this story, Catherine, because he was one of the kind of mentors, if you will, that founded the Bank of International Settlements in Switzerland which is kind of a central bank to central banks. The whole purpose of founding the bank was to manage the, the payments and settlements between Western central banks and, and the German central bank, the Reichsbank, in handling the Allied war reparations for World War I. Now, I mentioned the Bank of International Settlements because it forms a crucial part of this whole uh, post-war uh, breakaway civilization idea. And the reason why is that during the war, the Bank of International Settlements was, was heavily under the influence of the Nazis. And they parked a bunch of their gold reserves in the Bank of International Settlements. And in addition to this, it was kind of the, the uh, point of entry for Nazi funds to flee Europe as, as the war started to turn against the Germans and then to make it from there into the major Western banks. I think what you have being created after the war, to put it in a nutshell, is a kind of detente that is struck between the, the surviving oligarchies of, of Nazi Germany on the one hand, and for that matter, Imperial Japan, and the American financial oligarchs on the other. And, and we'll get back to why I think that there's this detente that at least was put into place at the end of, of World War II. But all of this is about technology, you're right. And, and in a nutshell, there is in Nazi Germany a project called the Bell, all right, Die Glocke in German. If we look in turn at the post-war fusion project that was going on in Argentina under Juan Perón and that was being conducted by this German scientist, his name was Dr. Ronald Richter, he was actually involved in this project back in Nazi Germany. So in other words, what we have is a continuation 
of this super secret Nazi research project that was going on inside of the Third Reich during World War II. We have a continuation in Argentina of the very same project after World War II, and for that matter, when Perón exposes the project in 1951, six years after World War II. Now, this means you have organization. This means you have finance. This means you have a technical infrastructure in place that can get this scientist the necessary equipment, and on and on we could go. So the implications of it in terms of this idea of a breakaway civilization are rather breathtaking, and that implies in turn that the Nazis had a large pool of, of liquid capital that they could draw on after the war. And once we say that, we're dealing with what I think was really the hidden purpose of the formation of the Bilderberg Group. And, and let me explain that briefly. When you look at the founding of the Bilderberg Group, you have on the one side, you have on the Anglo-American side, of course, the involvement of the Rothschilds, the involvement of, of David and, and Lawrence Rockefeller, and so on and so forth. But on the European side, who do you have? You have a fellow by the name of Prince Bernhard, who is, of course, a kind of a minor German nobleman who marries into the Dutch royal family. And interestingly enough, Prince Bernhard held a managerial position during World War II in, guess who, IG Farben. So there's yet another Rockefeller German business connection. And in addition to that, Prince Bernhard was an SS officer. All right? Now, one of the major guests at these very early Bilderberg meetings was a fellow by the name of Dr. Hermann Josef Ops. And at that time in history, he was the CEO of Deutsche Bank. During the war, he was actually at a small handling bank in Berlin that did nothing but handle the government accounts of the Reich. In other words, this was the man that signed the check to pay Adolf Hitler's salary as chancellor. So what I suspect is going on at these early Bilderberg meetings is they're, they're dealing with all of this Nazi loot, and they're trying to figure out how they're going to move it into Western banks, and let's face the fact, what all of this liquid capital means is that these Western banks can then keep some of it off the books as a kind of a secret reserve. They vastly expand their ledger credit making entry ability after the war. This, this would account for that massive post-war expansion of credit, this and some other things. And in the meantime, the Nazis have access to the financial markets. They're in effect laundering their money. And the thing that really drove this home for me, Catherine, was when I read a book by a former CBS journalist by the name of Paul Manning. He was a close associate of, of the old um, anchorman Ed Murrow. All right? mm -hmm. Paul Manning wrote a book called Martin Bormann, Nazi in Exile, because his research had convinced him absolutely that, that the Nazi Party leader, Martin Bormann, had survived the war and was somehow kind of the, the senior manager, so to speak, of this post-war Nazi enterprise, whatever you want to call it. And Manning came across something that dumbfounded him, and to this day it dumbfounds me. And that is, in the early 60s, Martin Bormann cashed a, a rather substantial check on Manufacturers Hanover and Chase Manhattan Bank. All right. Now, here's the real rub. He cashed the check over his own signature. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, what does that tell you right there? Uh -huh. and, and, you know, to make matters much worse, <laughs> the check was cleared by Deutsche Bank and Buenos Aires. <laughs> okay. So, you know, that, that little thing right there ought to tell everybody that, you know, we're dealing with, you know, the same old, a nexus that occurred during the war between uh, American business and the Nazis, this nexus continues after the war. Can, yeah, they continue to do business. And I want to throw in a couple of other things. We see the 47 and 49 Act, the National Security Act and the CIA Act passed in 47 and 49, which gives them, which gives the U.S. government the ability to appropriate money and then and then shift that money out of the agency it's designated for and have it disappear into the black budget 
on a non-accountable basis. So that's one. Then we see the second thing is the United States literally opened up to the drug trade coming from, where did it come from? Latin America. <laughs> and and that money is is literally used to lever, you know, the money in the black budget. And, and it's completely non-accountable. That's then laundered with mortgage securities and government securities fraud, which levers it to an even greater amount. But then to me, what the coup de gras, you ready for the coup de gras? In 1980, George H.W. Bush, former head of the CIA, takes control. His deal with Reagan is he runs National Security Council and all intelligent enforcement. Uh, you know, that was the deal when he went on the ticket. He takes over and they engineer an executive order that qualifies private corporations to do, uh, to do, secret and highly classified functions uh, paid for by the U.S. government. So now you've, not only have you created a trillion dollar black budget, but now it can finance private corporations owning and controlling the most advanced technology in the world on a completely non-transparent, non-accountable basis. This is precisely the same structure that that I'm seeing, Catherine. This this right. nexus of people, high level bureaucrats within intelligence, and the private corporate world with black budgets and secret research into into technology into technology. The the bad side of this is since you mentioned Latin America and the drug trade and how American intelligence penetrated this, the other side of that coin is that the on the ground penetration by American intelligence of these drug cartels is being handled by the soldiers on the ground who are, guess what? Nazis. And the right. reason I say that, there's there's an excellent book out by a fellow by the name of Henrik Kruger. And I cite this work in, in the Nazi International, the, the book of, of that title that I wrote. And Kruger points out that it's during the 60s and 70s that there's a massive restructuring of the way that the global drug trade is conducted. And the people behind this are attempting to take the French out of the picture. You know, this would explain many of the attempts on General de Gaulle's life. And the people behind this are attempting to restructure it. And as they're doing so, you find this huge penetration of the international drug trade by these post-war fascist networks, for want of a better expression. So you've got yet another nexus here in this breakaway civilization. You're dealing with vast amounts of very criminal money, as you point out, being laundered through banks, through government securities, and so on and so forth. And, and this whole vast enterprise, in turn, looks to, to be supporting some sort of vast secret research project of some sort. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in total agreement with you. This, this is exactly what I've been finding in my research. And the question it raises to my mind, Catherine, is what are they doing with all of this money? It's obvious how they're laundering it, you know, mortgages and, and bonds and securities and derivatives and so on and so forth. But what are they using it for? And again, I go back to the fact that if, if we're dealing with technologies such as the Nazi bell, if on top of this you have an increasing, you know, phenomenally increasing presence of something in our skies, usually over military bases, and right. no one really knows what it is, then this is going to become a hot-button national security issue. And that, in turn, is going to foster a great deal of, of hidden and secret research. And I suspect that this is, in part, what explains it. I also suspect, like you put it earlier, that this has functioned as a, as a slush fund for all sorts of, of covert operations and, and uh, covert political activities. But, you know, this, if all of this is true, then, yes, we're looking at a breakaway civilization of some sort. So my point is that there was a transatlantic nexus that's military, industrial, and scientific, developing as early as the late 19th century and ultimately yielding the German military-industrial complex of the 1940s. And then that was harvested in 1945 
by the United States. Uh, so, you know, Operation Paperclip imported thousands of uh, German scientists from various fields, not just rocket science, into the United States. Um, people as prominent as Werner von Braun, who uh, was made the head of NASA and took us to the moon. You know, the majority of, of the scientists uh, at the upper echelon of the Apollo program were former Nazis. Uh, and high-ranking Nazis, like Kurt Davis, for example. It wasn't just Von Braun. He staffed his uh, planning group for the Apollo program with his former Nazi colleagues. And the man himself, Von Braun, wasn't your, your average uh, card-carrying member of the party. He was an SS major. So when you see that degree of import uh, and harvesting of the, the Nazi military-industrial complex, you can start to see what... Um, President Eisenhower was was worried about and what he was trying to warn the American people about in his farewell address when he talked about the, the unwarranted seizure of power by the military industrial complex. Uh, and it, the unfortunate thing is that it's not just the military industrial complex, it's also our intelligence apparatus. The National Security Act of 1947, which going back to Richard Dolan and his UFOs in the national security state, Dolan places a lot of emphasis on the National Security Act of 1947 and how it transformed the American Republic. What the 47 and 49 Act did as in combination was it allowed appropriations to claw money out of other agency budgets for the intelligence agencies on a non-transparent basis. So you have what you did with the 47 and 49 Act was you created an infrastructure that allowed money to be secretly channeled to, pr to secret and very, from a technology standpoint, unbelievably important, powerful projects on a non-transparent basis. So there's no accountability. And one of the things I'll tell you as a former government regulator is without transparency, you know, the shenanigans that go on, you know, it, it is very hard to manage big pots of money without some kind of feedback and, and redundant transparency to kind of keep everybody in check. Okay, so the, before we start this, we have to transcend the cover stories, okay? You hear four cover stories which are completely uh, irrelevant and we can't get into understanding what's going on in this planet until we blow by them. Um, the first one is corruption, okay? In the summer of 2000, I went to visit the chief of staff to the appropriations subcommittee that controls the 21 agencies, which include Treasury and the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Now, I was just trying to get my company paid. We, we, I was on a bill collection. <laughs> and, um, and the chief of staff looked at me with somebody I didn't know, and they said, uh, so, so remember, this is the senator who controls the appropriations to HUD, okay, controls the HUD budget. It's the most powerful position, more important than the White House in terms of controlling the money. Congress controls the first strings. So the chief of staff to this particular senator said, what do you think is going on at HUD? And I was just trying to get paid, so I was being discreet. I said, I don't know, what do you think is going on at HUD? And she looked me dead in the eye, flat, and said, HUD is being run as a criminal enterprise. Now, here's what's important for you to know. HUD at the time is on a matrix structure. HUD is controlled and operated by and with the New York Fed, the New York Fed member banks, the Department of Treasury, the Department of Justice, and inadvertently some of the intelligence agencies in the military. And it is run by the largest defense contractors in the world, or it was then. So Lockheed Martin had the lead contract, $150 million a year to run all their operations. So you cannot run HUD as a criminal enterprise unless all of those entities are helping you run HUD as a criminal enterprise. That's not corruption, that's a system. That's a plan. You know, I'm not gonna get in it today. I assure you the housing bubble in this country both the one we had in the 80s and the one we had in the 90s was a plan. It was engineered top-down from the highest levels of government. So think of the financial system as something that runs on three tracks. The overt economy financial system, which you and I see every day, the black budget, and then this hidden finance. And what I'm going to describe to you today, it's very simple, is that that hidden system in the black budget grew and grew and grew, and what happened in the bailout period is it simply overwhelmed the whole system. And we're watching an integration of those systems in what I refer to as the period from 19, the early 90s to 2012 as the financial coup d'etat. And my theory is that we've literally seen a fundamental change of control on how the planetary governance systems as a result of the shifts in money. 
and technology that happened during that period, so I'm going to be talking about it. Everybody here knows how a, a budget sheet works. If you look at the, the budget, uh, the balance statement for any company or for you personally, financially, on one side of the balance sheet you have the assets and on the other you have the liabilities and the equity. Okay, so I've just made a circular, I like doing things in circles. So um, if, you, if you follow the money, the reporters always say follow the money. If you follow the financial transactions, all assets and operations on planet Earth leave a financial footprint. You have transactions, you have funding, you have people who think they own certain things, on and on and on. And what we're watching on planet Earth, what we've been watching since 1947 is, you see huge sections of the financial system and the sort of map of the financial money, and there's nothing on the other side of the balance sheet. There's like this big question mark. And one of the, do you ever feel like the official reality and reality are getting further and further and further apart until your head is like a bungee rope? You know, I walk around saying it just gets weirder. And, and part of it is that, is that you have more and more money and more and more assets going into that thing and driving the whole ecosystem financially, you know, but until you look at that question mark, it's very difficult to do. So let's step back and look at the financial coup d'etat and then bring it back to the secret space program. I think, you know, that before the financial coup happened and before the rebalancing of the global economy with the World Trade Organization, we had in the G7, we had in the developed world, the governments, we had a lot of assets in, in communities at the municipal level. We had a lot of assets in the retirement systems. We had a lot of, of assets um, in the governments. So here we have the blue is liabilities, and I'm just guessing. This is the back of the envelope. We have liabilities and we have assets, and we have more assets than we are liabilities. We go through a process where we move all the liabilities back into the old systems. This is like bringing up new systems. We move all the liabilities into the old systems, and we shift a lot of the assets into what we are calling today the breakaway civilization. You know, we're talking about money on the scale of a leveraged buyout of the planet, which is essentially what I think the financial coup d'etat. We're not talking about corruption. This is a system. And if you go back into the 50s and 60s and you talk to or read the people who got the eyewitness reports of people who had engineered this system bottom up, because this has been going on for many, many decades, what they all tell you is it was the best of a lot of bad options. You know, we, the intelligence agencies, got in the organized crime business and grew the organized crime business because we had to have the money. We had to have it on a secret basis. We had to control. Now, I mechanism for it. Then, but think about this, because this is a very important governance issue. You take people who have the power to be completely non-transparent, even though they're operating under the cover of government and government law. So they have governmental authority, they can operate non-transparency, they have a license to kill. So they can kill with impunity, they are now empowered to run a hidden finance system using organized crime, narcotics trafficking, mortgage fraud, and the loot thereof in partnership with the people, you know, the people that we were fighting during the war. So you've got the Japanese Yakuza, you've got, you know, the Nazis, you've got all these different groups, okay? And, and you put them in the banking business where they not only control the money, but if you look at how the money's accumulating, remember they don't have to pay taxes, right? If you look at how that money is accumulating, they end up having more capital than everybody else. So you're talking from a governance standpoint of creating a very frightening kind of animal. In 1980, when George H.W. Bush became vice president and assumed responsibility for the National Security Council and the Intelligent Agency Incident Enforcement, they promulgated an executive order that allowed private corporations to handle highly classified secret projects. So now let's take those four things in combination. What have we done? We have created a financial mechanism that can borrow as much money as it wants globally and print as much money as it wants globally using citizens' credit and the, and the federal credit and give that money to private corporations for the most powerful secret projects on the planet in terms of technology. And they don't have to report to anybody and it's completely secret and non-transparent. But you're basically creating a secret source of an infinite amount of government money to pay corporations to develop and own the most powerful weapons, technology, and space programs on the planet. 
and it is completely out of control and not under congressional supervision. So here's the, here's the problem. Uh, yeah, so if we create these revolutionary technologies, whatever they're based on, free energy or some kind of electrogravitic propulsion system, um, isn't, isn't that really going like, to totally transform human society? Wouldn't that totally, or at least largely, liberate humanity in so many critically important ways? And let's just think about some of these implications. Free energy or some, some version of energy that's significantly better than uh, pulling petroleum out of the ground, the source of nearly every significant war that we've been having for the last century or more. Uh, yeah, I think it'd be a very, very liberating experience for humanity. But won't it also challenge the current structure of wealth and power here on planet Earth? That's a problem for these people who are sitting at the top of the human food chain and they're not necessarily willing to rock that boat. So what, it, what does this require? It's a system that requires, A, black budgets. Catherine earlier today talked at length about black budgets. Black budgets are more than just your classified federal tax dollars at work. Black budgets are more than simply, um, you know, U.S. citizens paying for military programs that they have no knowledge about, they have no control over, that are doing God knows what with the barest, thinnest veil of a pretext in their name, which is, of course, not on their behalf at all. It's more than that. Because if you need to, uh, oh, I don't know, raise secret armies, overthrow governments, illegally rig elections, or build a secret space fleet, you're going to need a lot of money. You're going to need a lot more money than uh, simply federal tax dollars. Um, and you also want money that's not so easily trackable and traceable that you don't have to answer to. So where do you get that money from? Well, you get it through financial shenanigans, financial fraud, you get it through uh, narco-trafficking money. Narco-trafficking is probably a top five industry in the world. Probably. It's right up there. Sim simply because drug traffic trafficking is illegal doesn't mean that no one wants the money because everybody wants that money. Everyone, everyone would like free money, particularly these agencies. I had a conversation with another gentleman. Um, one day I'll put all these names out there. Some of my uh, researcher colleagues know who I'm talking about. Uh, one, one gentleman <clears throat> who uh, had a lot of knowledge of, of how, the, how a lot of this worked out and, and made a very salient point to me, which was that the, first of all, the money going into these research and development programs related to this subject was enormous. He didn't give me a figure. But he said, think about this, no matter how enormous it is, the amount of money for the security on this program exceeds it by a factor of seven or eight times. So I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? This is a little more than guys with guns. Uh, we're talking, although that's part of it, we're talking maybe the construction of uh, underground infrastructure facilities, the cost of uh, managing and controlling the media, the cost of controlling political operatives that are prominent in the system. I, I could imagine that there's a lot of expenses going into this to contain this. So that was his insight. So you need black budgets. And what that, of course, requires, what that means is, uh, at least constitutionally, in terms of legality, in terms of uh, what this country likes to tell ourselves what we're supposed to be. This is a complete uh, overthrow of what the United States is supposed to be about. This is a fundamental moment where accountability must not, must not be open. It must not be transparent. Rightly or wrongly, I think wrongly, these people decided that this topic is vastly too important to be able to entrust to the general public, it's too serious, it's too dark, it's too threatening from their point of view. So you create black budgets and you essentially create a coup d'etat. That's what it is, it's a silent coup that takes place. And it took place by degrees, but fundamentally it took place, I would say in the 1940s. 
and it deepened and deepened and deepened. As a result, obviously, financial corruption. It's more than just black budgets. It's an entire manipulation of the global financial system to hide this reality. There are a series of labyrinthian-like um, financial cutouts, you know, phony offices and offices nested within other offices within others so that the, the, even the greatest accountants in the world would have a hard time figuring out the paper trail. And of course, when you get into a situation like that, you got a lot of free money for everyone who's able to just plunder at will. So it's a situation where it's not simply they're all on the up and up saying, well, we have to have this secret program so that people don't know. No, it's a situation where, yes, we'll have this secret program that people don't know about, and let's rob them in the process. Um, so that's been going on since, since this whole thing started. Tremendous deep corruption in which, of course, blackmail is the norm. And again, I'm re referencing Catherine here, but she's talked quite eloquently about this a number of times. The fact that if you get to a certain position of power in this country, or I would assume any country, but in this country, you'll end up having a sit down with NSA or CIA or FBI, and they will tell you, they will know, they've got the goods on you, and you'd better behave, or they'll destroy you. They'll make it very clear. These politicians, they may get into this field because of idealism at one point or another, but they very quickly learn if they get any kind of power whatsoever, they are owned outright by other interests. And that's what they have to work for, and they're, they're controlled. They're controlled through blackmail and through bribery and everything else that, that uh, influences people. Political corruption, this whole system predicated on black budgets, financial corruption, political corruption, classification of the technologies, holding our future hostage. So think of it this way. You've got a group of um, privatized, black budget scientists, security people, they control this radical technology that they are studying. This is really where I, I, I kind of conceived of the idea of a breakaway civilization. This is something that I mentioned first in um, uh, UFOs in the National Security State's second volume about five years ago. I'm glad I coined that phrase, I'm, and I'm very gratified that other researchers have, um, have found that it's, it's, you know, something worth following up on, and I'm very, very gratified that other researchers are trying to study the analytics and the structure of this. You know, we need a lot of people looking into this. Um, in any case, what happens with these classifications of the technologies is, let's say we're, we're part of that group. We're the scientists, and we come up with our breakthroughs. You know? We'll come up with, yes, money makers, better integrated circuits, lasers, fiber optics, and the rest. Those are nice ground floor investment opportunities for sure. But we may come up with something a little bit niftier than that. We may come up with electrogravitics that actually work, something that can give you true gravity reduction. We may come up with a new form of energy, better than petroleum. Of course, we can't let the rest of the world know about that. That's, that's off limits. We wouldn't be allowed to, because our bosses, the private interests that fund our operation, would say, no, 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 can't do that. So what would we do? We would simply classify those technologies, and there are thousands upon thousands of classified patents along these lines in the US. And uh, one of the gentlemen in this research field, Thomas Vallone, worked at the US Patent Office for years. And he's spoken at this, about this at length. Tom Vallone's one of the best experts on electrogravitics out there as well. So you've got a whole series of classified technologies that are off limits to us. And as I say, it holds our future hostage. So if you were smart enough to come up with your own version of electrogravitics, you wanted to patent it, oh, yeah, I think you'd have a hard time getting that thing patented. You'd be running into some classified stuff. And incidentally, this is a key reason why there is now a movement, I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself, but not too much, but a key reason why there's this global rush right now to solidify a, a transnational legal structure. You know, not just NAFTA, not just the uh, transatlantic um, 
free trade agreement with Europe and not just with the TPPA, the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. The whole thing's coming into place right now. And one of the key things that they, they feel that they must do is nail down intellectual property rights so that if some genius person in uh, India or China or some other place comes up with <laughs> a nice electrogravitic system, that that too is says, no, 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 you're, you're going into classified territory, proprietary. That's the whole point. You classify it to keep that fence around us in place for as long as possible and as strongly as possible. But you have to do more than that. This whole system requires a comprehensive approach. It requires control over the media, and I mean total control over the media. Total and significant total control. So, sure, you can allow, um, you know, some cable station to put out a UFO documentary that talks a little bit about this. It's best if you get the kind of he said, she said documentary where they, you put a little bit of one side of out there and then you, put, you bring in a couple of skeptics and they say, no, that's all nonsense. That, that's being objective, they like to think. And they'll put a little bit of that out there for the people because they know people are becoming more and more interested because we're living in a totally revolutionary era right now. But over the main media, over the establishment media, that's totally controlled. We all know this. It's funny, when I started researching this uh, subject uh, exactly 20 years ago, uh, I'm sure many of you remember, it was a much harder sell, even then, crazy as it sounds, but it was a much harder sell to convince people that our media was as totally controlled as it is. I don't think it's a hard sell anymore. I think we've kind of gone through all of that. I think most people, to e even people beyond this room here, even people beyond those who may be watching this on YouTube, they know that there is a vast control over media. And one of the reasons, not the only, but one important reason that this media must be controlled is for this subject. It's essential. Not only the presence of others, but the fact that we have been developing a profoundly advanced infrastructure that is being kept away from ordinary people. Media must be controlled. Global totalitarianism. I've been thinking a little bit about this lately, and, I, and I've, um, I think my opinion now is that it is seen as a necessary component of maintaining this system of secrecy. You can't just have it as a partial thing. You have to have total control. We've moved into a global world. We're trading with each other every single day around the world. We're all relying on each other in critical ways every single day around the world. So you must have a system in place they feel, of having total control, a totalitarian system, literally totalitarian. And this is exactly what's being planned for. It's exactly um, you know, what they're working on. In short, this system must be predicated on everything that we're seeing in our world today. We're seeing the results of it now. Which means that there's, you know, from that point of view, there's no way that those people who have got control over this secret, there's no way that they can ever undo secrecy over this program, not in their opinion. And this is why for years I've, I've characterized disclosure as a paradox. You know, I've always said it's impossible, but on the other hand, I, I do maintain, I continue to maintain that it's also inevitable. But the reason it's impossible is, is, is partly because of what I've just described to you here. This, this is very deeply entrenched in our, our world. And, um, you know, it's one of these things where when I, I look back on my, uh, my 20 years now in this field, how uh, astonished I am at, at the journey that I've gone through in the sense that I started out 20 years ago with a very simple question. It wasn't even, are UFOs real? I wasn't even at that level. My question was so simple. It was, was this subject something that the national security community in the U.S. truly cared about ever? Because if they cared about it, why had I never read about it in any academic history book ever? I mean, why would that not be interesting? 1950, go back in time, you've got the Korean War breaking out, you've got um, the end of the Berlin airlift, all of this Cold War drama, you got Harry Truman dealing with all these problems, and then what, flying saucers? Were they actually interested in this? Well, it turns out, yeah, they were. 
And I thought, well, you know, wow. This truly is the most revolutionary subject that you can imagine here on planet Earth. I, I think that it is. I think the UFO reality. And, and think about how this subject is handled within the, even the alternative research community at large. The UFO phenomenon gets kind of a strange uh, position there where a lot of alternative researchers, they're, they're afraid to get into this subject. I've spoken to so many of them privately and they're fascinated by it, but they will not go there publicly because it's just too much. It's too much of a ridicule factor. It's too much of a distraction. It's too much. They, they get into the crosshairs of the media and it's just too much work for them. So what does that tell you? Well, it tells you that this is, this is the gold mine of, of the alternative subject. This really is it. This is the core. To ignore the history then of, of the UFO, you're also, if you ignore the UFO, you are unable really to make sense out of the financial system. This mechanism is put into place to deal with it. And therefore, to ignore it, to borrow the phrase and insight of, of Secretary Fitz, this constitutes a gaping material emission, not only in the historiography of the period, but in the understanding of the nature of the current financial system. The last thing I want to stress is please, there is much going on in the world that, um, that inspires anger or emotion, but I want to stress that our situation is far too serious for the luxury of unbridled emotion, okay? You know, this is a dangerous situation. We're dealing with a lot of serious risks, okay? And one of the things I can promise you, having worked on Washington and Wall Street, most of the people I dealt with and worked with in Washington and Wall Street were as fine a people as I've ever known. I cannot explain what's happening by the fact that they're bad guys. Now, have I watched people who I work with who I thought were good guys behave in highly irresponsible, unethical, and evil ways? Yes. So I'm not saying I forgive them. There's some of them I, I'm constantly calling names. You know, I always give Goldman Sachs a hard time. I used to work there. Um, but please don't try and explain what's going on just with saying they're evil and we're good because one of the things we have to deal with is the fact that this system is implemented one community and one household at a time all around the world and we are all guilty, indirectly or directly, okay? We all have to take responsibility, not because that's the right thing to do, but that's how we get our power. It's by dealing with me and changing me and working outward from that that I gather power. And that's what we need in this situation because we're up against a lot of power. If your UFO MacGuffin is the thing in play here, Daniel, then they've got to have control of the narrative. They cannot have other versions of the narrative out there. This is why they were in such a hurry to shut down those secret space program conferences. Yes. They could not afford an independent or critical narrative that was not under their control to be out there could not do no it. question there's a problem there because you had history science right. finance right uh and political geopolitical uh, references all in that it wasn't a yes. fantasy story about right inner earth princesses and things and <laughs> you've also set up you know if my if my uh speculation is true you've also set up a gigantic financial infrastructure Yes. To fund to fund secret research. Right. And so it's a and, system of finance. Right. Yeah. Right. You you have to control the narrative because that system depends on that control. Welcome back. 